we sketched out just a, a, a set of things we wanted to talk about. Um, this is maybe actually I'm going to do a zero in this agenda. Number, sorry, no, number one. I'm going to add what the heck are we doing? So I just want to try to set some context for what our, uh, when I say our, I mean Rebus objectives are here, and maybe if other people can jump in with that, um, please feel free to. Uh, and I guess if someone can keep just posting the agenda every once in a while for new people who arrive, because I guess you can't see in the chat above. Um, I wonder, actually, I think we're a small enough group that we could just do quick roundabouts to say just, just quickly your name and your institution. Um, and maybe I'll just introduce what our objectives are first and then we can do those introductions quickly. So uh, I think that peer review or review generally is a thing that needs to be solved to make open textbooks work properly and have the um, faith that people need to have in the content. It seems like it's a problem across academic publishing in general as a, as a model. And so I think there's an opportunity for this group to get together and see if we can think of ways to um, think about best, best practices and maybe formalizing different sorts of ways that we might go about making sure that open textbooks get reviewed in a, in a range of different ways perhaps, but in a way that, that we get to um, having a sense that uh, we have an approach a coherent approach among all of us to, to getting um, open textbooks reviewed and that we have kind of a, a, a way to go about doing that. Um, so that's generally what we're hoping to get out of this. So um, I probably should let everyone do the intros first, but um, what I'll do is I'll just call on the names because I have a list here. I don't know if everyone's got the list in the same order, but I'll just call on everyone's name to just say who you are and, and your institution quickly and then uh, and then we'll kind of dive in. My hope is that everyone's gonna talk. It won't just be me, obviously. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start just with Liz. You're mute. Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Mays. I'm with the Rebus community. Okay, uh, I'm Hugh and I am uh, Rebus community as well. Over to Karen. Hi everyone, I'm Karen Lordson with the Open Textbook Network and I'm thinking about peer review both in terms of the library, publishing, and professional development support for our members. Super. Um, and then I'm not sure I actually saw it further up, but um, Laura. Yes. And you're mute, I think, Laura, so you have to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm from the University of Arkansas, and we're just starting with open uh, textbooks, and peer review is the first thing I was told to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Zoe, you're up next. Hi, everyone. I'm Zoe. I no, know you're I, mute. Oh, no, yeah, you're not. I have to be mute. Yes. We were in the same room. There are lots of computers on the table. Um, so I am the community and project manager here at Rebus. Okay, next, uh, Deb. And you, you'll have to unmute. Hi, uh, Deb Quintel, sitting in a very tall chair from Cali. <laughs> Excellent. And Cali, just for everyone who doesn't know, is the, uh, go ahead, Deb, say what it is. It's, it's the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Uh, we're uh, in the legal services world. We do ebooks and uh, tutorials for law students primarily. Excellent. Uh, Julie, you're up next, and you have to unmute. Hi everyone, Julie Lang from Penn State. Julie, uh, Nicholas, you're up. Yes, hi, Nicholas Persa from UW Madison, soon to be UCI in California. Excellent. Billy, you're probably the farthest away from everyone else. Hi, I'm Billy Mikey. I'm the OER technologist for the University of Hawaii. Excellent. Cheryl. I'm Cheryl Collier from the University of Arizona. Excellent. Allison? I am Allison Brown. I'm uh, at SUNY Geneseo in New York, and I also work with SUNY OER Services. Excellent. Next is Erin. Hi, I'm Erin Davis from Utah State University, and this is my colleague, Sharon Struby. Excellent. Uh, that looks like Peter. Uh, yes, uh, this is Peter Potter. I'm at uh, 
Virginia Tech. I'm director of publishing strategy and I'm working on developing our publishing program here, which includes um, open ed resources. Awesome. Robin? Hi, Robin Ashford from George Fox University in Portland, Oregon, and I'm the e learning librarian. Um, almost completed our first uh, year of our open textbook initiative. Nice. Rady, you're up next. Rady's in an airport, so he's going to leave himself on mute. Um, okay. But we're very impressed with his commitment. <laughs> uh, so Rady is from Spark, for those of you who don't know him, but most of you probably do. He's always around these parts. Excellent. Uh, Lisa? Oh, hi. I'm Lisa. Um, I'm just a newly graduated uh, I'm LRI student um, from Milwaukee, and now I'm doing my internship in the UW Lacrosse. And yeah, and um, before I'm doing the internship on the OER sources. So yeah, I'm interested. In, and hello, everyone. Excellent. Uh, Apurva? Well, I'm also with the Rebus community. Excellent. And Apurva has been here for three days now. So yeah. <laughs> uh, Anthony, you, I'm going to put you on the spot. You've just joined. Can you just introduce yourself? Oh, maybe he's not connected yet. And there's someone on the telephone. I'm not sure who that is. Um, and I don't know how you want, would unmute that person. But um, OK. And Anthony, can you hear us yet? So I'll just do a quick Anthony's from uh, OpenStax. OK. Um, so how do we run a meeting that looks like this? Um, we put down just a handful of ideas of things that uh, we thought it would be interesting to talk about again with the idea of getting towards a, a clear process that we might all agree on or at least framework for processes that we might all agree on for, uh, let's see, that's what be open textbook. Um, for reviewing open textbooks. Um, and I have just a, a list of things. I wanted uh, Deb to talk about her review board. I have a notion of how we might extend that beyond legal instruction to how we could get everyone, you know, OER librarians thinking about a review board. So maybe we'll talk about, let Deb talk about what they do at Cali and then we can have some ideas around that. Um, I want to spend a bit of time talking about different types of reviews. Um, so we have four here. There's subject matter expert reviews, maybe open reviews, student and faculty beta testing, ongoing feedback, and kind of others. So I think there's different ways things might be reviewed. Um, and I think we should at least all kind of come to an understanding about what those things are and whether some are more important or less important than others. Um, there was this idea of formalizing the, the way to denotate that a, an open textbook is, is reviewed, um, maybe badges or markers. And I think it was uh, Billy who mentioned the Mozilla contribution badges is kind of a technical mechanism for doing this. So, so maybe Billy can talk a bit about that. But I think the idea is to try to signal, you know, if something has been reviewed, how do we do something like Creative Commons to signal that that book is not just openly licensed, but also has has been through review process of some kind. Um, another agenda item here was recognition of reviewers. So how do we make sure that anyone who's engaging in reviewing that they, they have some kind of recognition for what they're doing and make sure that that's kind of built into the ethos. Um, number six has other ideas, so we'll leave that open uh, for the moment. If anyone wants to add anything here, please do. I think Nicholas added a few, which is what are some of the reviews, reviewing tools that exist so peer review tools on the web, um, how do current tools and resources facilitate the mission of peer review, how does it work? So maybe Nicholas can talk about that. Um, and communities, what kind of communities exist already? Um, so, so that's a, an overview. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll just pause for now. That's a lot of things. We have kind of an hour budget. I don't know what we're gonna get through. What I would like to get through at the end of this is maybe, have an idea of a few things that might be worked on further that we might break into smaller groups to, to work on. So that's kind of, I'm hoping to um, uh, strong arm some people into doing something like that. 
which I guess that's sort of our job at Regis. We seem to spend a lot of time trying to force people to do things they didn't know they were getting themselves into. Um, but okay, so I don't know if, the, is there anything else? So just open it up in case anyone has something else that they think is critical that we talk about. There's already a, a fair pile here, but um, is there anything kind of missing from, from a first call about this issue? I guess I have a, I have a question about sort of if you, if you have an idea of kind of a, a very high altitude view of how you'd like this to look, um, how you'd like a peer review. I mean, are you thinking about it being a policy? Is it the sort of thing where it's going to be more guidance? Um, what, how do you sort of, uh, in some way to kind of give us a sense of where you want to see this go? Uh, so, so I guess I'll, I'll our sort of standard tack on that is we want to go where this community thinks it ought to go. Um, at the same time, I guess I, we do have some kind of opinions about it. So I would think sort of uh, something like a policy of what ought to happen. So sort of best practices for what reviewing processes ought to happen that would be transparent and open and anyone can, you know, use them or, or not. Um, for us as well, we're always thinking of this, like how does the system work and what, what kind of tools might help make this happen? So trying to understand what it is that people think need to happen and how it might go by happening. But I actually don't know very much about peer review as a process. So I don't think I'm even ready there yet. But I think, I think you know, at the very least, I think sort of a shared statement from a group of people saying, this is what we think should happen um, you know, an open textbook should, in best practice, best case, go through this set of things. Um, and if it's done that, then it's, you know, we, we are confident that it's, it's going into the world with, with, the best, um, with the best possible starting step. So, so I think that's, that would be starting point. And then, and then I think further, uh, especially like when I look at this first thing, the review board, I'm very interested in specifically setting up, like how do we actually get some of those things to happen? Um, and, and maybe, so, so that's probably a good intro. So actually, if we, I could get anything out of this working group generally, would be to get us starting to think about how we could have a system-wide across the OTN and, and this group here and a broader group of people who are willing to help support open textbook review within their institutions and mechanisms that might make that happen. So maybe that's a good intro to Deb, who seems to have disappeared. Oh, no, there she is. Um, Deb, I wonder if you could talk about uh, the peer review board that you guys put together and how that works. And then I'd be interested, after Deb's talked about that, if we could have a discussion about how that might apply, you know, if we thought about that broadly in this community, how could we apply this in, in this community? So, Deb. Uh, hi. So uh, we created a board to review our lesson tutorials, which run on the web, uh, basically because I didn't like cold calling people. Um, quality control and credentialing are very big in the legal world. Um, we have mixed stories as to whether or not the primary publishers still do peer review, but I already had uh, 60 law professors and law librarians from across the country assembled to review lessons. So expanding off of that to review books wasn't that big of a problem. Um, I minimize. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I do for each book is I look to my editorial board and I send out a call and say, does anyone on the board teach in torts, for example, which is a, a classic um, beginning, it's equivalent of like a 101 course for law students. Um, does anyone teach torts? And then do you have any colleagues at your school who would want to participate with us? Then I also ask the author of the book, who does the author suggest that I go out and ask for reviews? Um, and so, and then after that, then I start trolling blogs. Um, and just, I just think to myself, oh, I haven't talked to someone from Stetson Law School in a while. And I wander to their website and find somebody. Or, oh, I, I need some um, nationwide diversity. So now I'm going to try uh, UC Irvine or something. So um, I eventually, 
I try and get people to review one chapter. Um, I've actually, um, my colleague Elmer Hewlett talked with you, I think, at the last OER about using um, the press books tools to, to, to review things. And we haven't implemented that, but that's on my to-do list somewhere. Um, so right now, it's kind of a primitive method. I just send out the entire book, which is a Word document, and I tell the person that they're reviewing a particular chapter that they picked. I let people pick because I'm going to get better results if they're picking their favorite topic. Um, I give them a strict deadline for when it has to be looked at um, because most of us, if we're given two weeks, we wait 12 days and then start it. So if I give them 30 days, they wait 28 uh, and start it. So I'd rather have a little wiggle room for um, uh, applying my um, uh, pervasive frightening skills to get them to turn it in on time. Um, and then uh, I ask for a very simple review. I ask them to, I don't go for style editing by any means um, because the folks that I'm dealing with, law professors, are not fond of being style edited. Um, so I, I sort of catch that stuff a little bit on my own as we do a final proofread, like the sentence that you just can't, you can't find a subject in no matter how hard you look. Um, those, those quirky things. Um, and I ask everybody to answer three questions when they're reviewing it. Um, is, is it accurate? Is the chapter accurate such that they would teach from it? Do they expect, are they expecting, are they seeing what they would expect to see in that chapter about that subject? And then the tradition of the law school world is you have edited cases in a chapter, you have um, brilliant expository material written by the author, uh, and then you have questions that are designed to allow the student to play in the gray area. Um, they're not really questions like you might find in math where it's solve a particular equation for an answer. It's more wrestle with this idea and find one answer among possibly many. And so are the questions sophisticated enough or are they ridiculously simple? Um, and that's, and, and I ask people to do one to two pages. Some folks go a little bit beyond. Um, at some point when you're dealing with 12, 15 chapter books, if everyone sends me 15 pages, that's overwhelming. And um, <laughs> There's not enough um, Harry and David fruit baskets that I can send out to sobbing authors in that instance. So um, I prefer to have one or two pages on each chapter. That gives me an indication as to whether or not the chapter is okay. Um, if the review comes back really dark about the book and it's extremely troubled with the content, then I'll go out to somebody else and get the same chapter reviewed. Um, and sort of make sure that it's not a glitch in the review process, but indeed some issue with the book. And then I work extensively with the author to um, help them see the criticism in the context with which it is written um, with love and warmth and furthering of the OER world. Um, and, and so I can spend um, hours sometimes talking authors through what different comments mean and we do reviews anonymously I don't know if I mentioned that because um, sometimes I'm going to younger faculty and asking them to review a more senior um, the law school world is very credential oriented what rank school are you at um, where did you personally go um, it's it's kind of like the dog breeding world, I guess, in that aspect. Um, so so um, uh, I do it anonymously, and that way people don't have to fear that um, if they run into someone at a conference and they've said something honest but hard to swallow, um, and that's pretty much our process. I, I give a modest amount of money for the review simply because I can then um, if people don't do it on time, I can pull it back from them. Uh, and, and that's our process, I think. So that is, uh, I have about 25 questions that I've made that Zoe's written down here. Whoa, whoa okay. No, I, I don't think, <laughs> in fact, I, I don't think that we have time to go in, in too much detail here, but the kinds of questions that, that you've just raised for me, that again, I would like, maybe this is something that we go after this process to try to sort of winnow down to some questions, but 
for instance, do, 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 does this group, do you think we would be ready to recommend whether, you know, is a chapter by chapter review with different people for each chapter? Is that, is that a, a good approach? Is that a safe approach? The anonymous reviewing is another kind of question. How to deal with the sobbing authors is, is another question in OER. Um, uh, so anyway, there's, there's a bunch of questions there. I don't know if we want to touch on any of those or if anyone else had, had some quick questions. I, I guess I did, I'm, I'm a bit sensitive. We have sort of an hour and, and we could probably talk for days on this. Mm -hmm. process that we spread some time around. Um, but maybe we'll take two questions for Deb and if we can keep them tight and whoever waves in the in the thing or jumps in first gets to ask the first question. Okay. Um, uh, okay, that's that's maybe the best way is we'll try to pick some questions out of the um, out of the, the chat bar. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Dave Robin asked, uh, we'll see that she likes the idea of the, the chapter rather than the entire book approach and she asked whether you have a review for every chapter in the book. Um, chapter versus whole book and what was the last part? Uh, would, you have, would you have to have a review for every chapter? Does every chapter get a review? Oh. So in my dream world, yes, every chapter gets a, a review. Um, in the real world, I I aim for at least 75% of the chapters. Okay. Um, assuming that those chapters all come back okay, then I don't stress about the remaining chapters that did not get reviewed. And I'll maybe take a spin through them to make sure that things sort of read smoothly. Um, the one chapter approach is done for a number of reasons. Um, chapters run roughly 40 to 60 pages in my world. And it's difficult to get the attention of law faculty who are doing their own scholarship, who are doing teaching, who are doing committee work at their school, um, who have lives. It's difficult to get them to read more than that. Sometimes I do get people who want to review a couple chapters. Um, and that's, that's good, but I don't want one person reviewing a bulk of the book because I like the diversity of opinion and viewpoint also. Um, the, um, the the one chapter approach also, um, if you think of each chapter as a, a color of crayon um, in the box, um, and some faculty spend their entire life focused on magenta, and they are experts on magenta, and all they think about is magenta, and all they write about is magenta, and they use the other 23 colors in the box simply because the university pays them to teach a broad box of crayons. Um, but they really, given their life, they would prefer to travel the country talking about magenta. So if I can get them to review the chapter on magenta, then I'm bringing the best expertise possible to the magenta chapter. So I love my crayons. <laughs> Deb, I think you have the best metaphors of anyone in any of these calls that we've had. So. Oh, thanks you. Um, Okay, is there, is there any other quick question for Deb? And then I have a quick proposal that I want to float, but uh, is there any other question for Deb? And again, I think we're, we're going to have to go back and, and figure out how we talk about this stuff in more detail. Yeah. Today. Um, okay, so uh, I think Billy raised your hand there. Yeah, I have a quick question for Deb. Um, so I understand um, the metaphor, different crayons in the box. I'm wondering um, if you have any one reviewer kind of go through the entire box of crayons to make sure it's it's readable, like you know, the, the crayons aren't different lengths. You know, you always find the one that's really whittled, whittled down at the bottom. Nice, yeah. Um, so, um, I do, so the first phase is the rough, the, the, what I call the first draft comes to me and I send it out for my box of crayon review to a dozen uh, people. Um, and then the author takes those comments and they come up with a second draft. Um, and then the second draft, which we call the final draft, um, that one, my current um, method of operation is I find a law professor um, or a law librarian, uh, someone who has pretty good understanding of the material, um, to go through the entire book um, looking only at certain parts. Um, I, I, because 
books are made of edited uh, judicial cases, um, they can skip that. But I have them just look at the author's brilliant expository portions and uh, have them look at the questions um, and make sure that no errors have crept in since the first review. So that is one person who goes through it all. Um, and then I actually make a spin through the whole thing too, um, just to make sure that uh, sentences for people coming new to the material. There's a big difference between all my experts who, you know, been living magenta to go back to our analogy for um, 25 years. And now we have someone who's four weeks into law school and they're learning about magenta. Um, and, and so you sometimes have to explain something a little bit differently to them. Um, and so I'll take a spin through it also. Yeah, I am worried about, um, uniformity and because the books get written over such a big span of time often. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Billy. Um, awesome. So uh, Anthony from OpenStax just commented in the chat bar just saying that that, that what you've described, Deb, is very similar to the OpenStax. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I have a, a, a proposal that I just want to um, about this and this is kind of what I've been thinking about since our last call on this issue and and to be discussed at a later date, but I just want to float the idea. What if we started developing a network of basically this group of people and, and, and a wider group who became sort of that review board? And what we could do is send out, you know, saying, I'd be willing to, in my institution, if let's say a geography open textbook comes through the transom to go out and at least talk to a geography subject librarian, for instance, and say, hey, there's a book that, that needs reviewing. Do you think you could find anyone who'd be interested in doing a chapter? So that's kind of what I had thought about was what if we get a collection of, you know, this, we have what, 12 of us or 20 or 100 of us who sort of said, yes, I will, in the name of forwarding OER, when something comes through the transom, I'll at least make an effort within my institution to see if I can find a review or for a chapter or more of that book. So that's, that's an idea I have that I want to float. And perhaps if that sounds interesting, maybe that's a thing that we might try to develop later. Um, with, I don't know, nods or thumbs up or something, does that sound, or actually, sorry, I'll do it the other way. Does anyone think that's a crazy idea or a bad idea? Yeah, Cheryl says, would reviewers be paid? Who, who knows, Cheryl? We, <laughs> um, I think that's sort of like, these are the kinds of questions we need to answer. I know that Deb pays reviewers. I know that um, Anthony pays reviewers. Um, okay, I'd like to kind of move on and see if we can get th through this. Is that okay with everyone? This is gonna be kind of fast and furious today, but, but as I say, maybe the agenda was a bit more <laughs> ambitious than it could have been. Um, so I don't know anything about review reviewing. Um, so I wonder if someone can help help talk about these things. Um, I know that I want definitely Karen to talk about reviewing in the context, Karen from OTN to talk about reviewing in the context of adopting OER and how important that is and, and just sort of what your process looks like. Um, but I, I, we sort of sketched out sort of four or five kinds of review that we imagine. So one is the subject matter review that, that Deb's just kind of discussed, I think, where you find experts in magenta and get them to review the magenta chapter. Um, then there might be something in the open textbook world, we don't worry about um, embargoes and copyrights in the same kind of way that a commercial publisher would. would. So we might do something, I know that Siuvala that does um, textbooks for elementary schools in South Africa, they do this and have had great results with it, which is having an open review where they put their books live on the web and have a mechanism for anyone who's interested to come and review that. And they, I don't know quite how they gather the community around it to do that. But, but so maybe there's sort of like a pre-publication, but kind of open review where anyone can check in and, and make comments that you may or disregard or not, but it's not as sort of formalized as as the subject matter reviews. Um, then there's kind of that open, the beta testing, beta um, review process where the book is actually being used in selected classrooms and, and some mechanism of feedback coming back from the professors and students back to the, um, back to the authors. Um, and then so the book goes out into the world, 
more officially published and then there's you know we need to be thinking about how can there be ongoing feedback to come back into the into the book and are there kind of other things to think about so i just kind of wanted to throw those those ideas and and one of the things i think about as i hear what deb kind of mentioned and I don't know if anyone has experience in commercial publishing here, but it seems to me that if we get this right, it may be that open textbooks have the possibility to be far better, you know, go through a much more rigorous review process than, than commercial textbooks. Um, looking at this, I don't think this necessarily happens on such a formalized way in other books. And if we can get the systems right, maybe open textbooks can do this. Anyway, I wanted to open up, are there, are there things we're missing? Does, does that sound right? That sort of collection of types of review? Um, I don't know if anyone has any comments there. And then I do want Karen just to talk about reviewing in the context of adoption and, and what OTN does. But first, anyone, are, am I kind of missing a piece of that puzzle or does anyone have opinions on any of that? I see nodding, so I'll, I'll say that's okay. <laughs> Peter, you look like, yeah, it sounds okay. <laughs> um, so over to Karen. Uh, so there just there are a couple of things in the chat. Um, so Robin okay. has raised the question of whether pre-pub review is done before copy editing and sort of related, Deb said that there's the issue of changes to material happening. And so how do you review to revise and confirm the book up to date? So that could be an, another kind more than just the ongoing review, uh, a kind of a built-in um, phase, I guess, and another one of these um, kinds of review. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay, uh, Karen, do you want to take just a minute to talk about OTN again? Sure, sure. So um, I'll actually start with Robin's question that Zoe just touched on, which is sort of this larger question of caring for an open textbook, which I think this peer review um, question overlaps with greatly. It's like, okay, so we're producing all of these. How do we make sure they, they uh, stay up to date? So that's yet another angle that is on our minds, especially as I'm thinking about the library. Robin also mentioned in chat the uh, $200 that institutions allocate for reviewing an open textbook in the open textbook library. So co to contextualize that comment a little bit, these are of course post publication reviews. And when an institution joins the OTN, there is a workshop held specifically for faculty in which they're introduced to the Open Textbook Library to overcome that hurdle of, how do I find these books? Where are they? Are there some in my subject area? And then um, as part of that, and we frame it in sort of a prof professional development context rather than uh, we're paying you for reviews, but we're introducing you to these open educational resources. Um, they're given a rubric, and I'll put that link uh, in the chat. It was adapted from BC Campus, and faculty go ahead and look at a textbook in their, um, in their subject area. So we leave reviewing uh, to the experts to them. But as we're thinking about how to support publishing together with Rebus, and perhaps as a few other models, we'll be thinking about this pre and during publication peer review also. Um, and I think, I think I covered it. Is there anything I left out that... Um, the, you want me to mention? So uh, I guess the thing that's interesting to me is the this kind of systemic value that this reviewing process generally has. Mm -hmm. kind of got that, like, so I think there's three key things there. One, first of all, make sure the content is good. So that, that makes sense. Two, I think there's a real power in sort of either building the community or building the, the faith in adopting it. So So what you're talking about, Karen, is that can you just quote that number when people review your adoption rates based on reviewing, which I think is, is really interesting. I don't know if you remember that number. But. I don't know if I have that number top of mind. I can say that 60% of the open textbooks in the library are reviewed. And I think it's somewhere in 40, 50% in terms of adoption once they've taken a look, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, someone, so actually, someone in the OTN may actually have that. Yeah. that number top so, of mind so, so that's really 40% okay yeah 40% is what I recall is that when someone reviews there's a 40% chance that they're then going to adopt that into their um into their classroom mm -hmm. so so there's sort of like making sure the content's good then there's kind of building this kind of like engagement community and then there's a last piece which is the one you mentioned as well Karen which is the ongoing health of this content so how do we sort of 
but can we address those three things as a community with with a, a smart kind of coherent approach to to um, reviewing? Um, okay, we're at uh, three forty now here. So again, I don't know if I don't know if anyone has any other comments on on that piece, um, but I just wanted to sort of highlight those different places where review might happen. Um, any other comments on that item? If I, if I could. Uh make one this Anthony uh, from OpenStax. I'll just, I'll just mention the value of that is um, really apparent. You know, we have a lot of reviewers on our books, but what a number of adopt, potential adopters want to see is something independent. Um, so referring them to the OTN reviews, and I, I did it last week and, you know, secured an adoption of our calculus textbook and, you know, countering the type, uh, you know, we, we don't like to be at odds with the mainstream publishers, but when they are presenting, you know, um, comparative reviews of, of their textbook versus another that are done by, you know, reputable faculty, that's compelling. And, you know, for, uh, for the open community to have something along those lines, like these independent reviews and a rating system uh, really, really helps. And the committee at, at this college, it was a six person committee and they were, they were pretty pleased to see uh, what, what was there from the OTN which was very helpful and very validating and uh, helps with the credibility. Yeah. So, so that's an interesting thing is how do we sort of do this in a way that, that is independent and what's what's the process for making sure that independence is recognized and it's not just uh you know like in commercial publishing where the author's best buddy is always the person blurbing in the back of the book right, right, right. um cool okay i i added another um uh item here but i think we'll just skip over because it it's been mentioned a couple of times uh the rubrics and reviewing guides but i think that's something that Again, you know, there's some resources out there, OTN, BC Campus, and, and that's something that, again, it'd be nice to get a broad consensus on that, probably what, what, you know, and there may be slightly different approaches for the different stages in reviewing. Um, okay, the, the next one has to do with how do we uh, formalize or standardize the markers, and we had just uh, it's come up a bunch of times, this idea that, um, you know, Creative Commons is powerful partly because it's it's defined sort of a, a legal sphere and there's kind of branding associated with what a Creative Commons license icon looks like. And just this idea of if we can develop this notion of what reviewing ought to be, may, is there can we think about having some kind of, I don't know, gold star, this was reviewed up to the whatever standard and maybe something else was reviewed at a slightly lower standard and, oh, this one hasn't been reviewed at all. Um, I don't know if, uh, Billy, maybe you want to talk about the Mozilla Science Contribution badges and the work being done there. Um, but I just think, I think that sort of from a branding perspective, if we can signal in, in these books that they have uh, they've been through this process in an easy to understand way that's going to be helpful. I don't know if anyone agreed. Maybe I'm totally off base on that, but um, anyway, for, why don't, Billy, why don't you have a, a quick overview of what the Mozilla is doing on, on the badges universe? Sure, sure. So there are kind of two sides to this. One is the actual content side and being able to signal at what stage or level the content has been reviewed already. So people know how to jump in if they can. Um, but then the other side, and that's related to the, Mozilla Science Lab, their use of open badges, which is a much big, bigger project, basically recognizing everybody who had a hand in producing a research product. Um, and that kind of relates to OER because as we know, there can be multiple people who touch it before it's actually published. Um, and even after it's published because you know, uh, post pub peer review begins to come in. Um, and so if you click on the link, I'm not sure if that goes to the Mozilla Science Lab, like their, their webpage for it or the GitHub repo is linked in there too. It's basically a mechanism they set up with, with ORCID and a couple different journals who have implemented it so that um, on a journal article, you can see, you can link out, or you can links out to all the different people who touched it and what they did. Um, and that's good in terms of reinforcing the value, you know, what, what, what's gone into this content, but also giving people who have touched it individual credit for, for those pieces. Um, does that connect back to people's ORCID ID then? 
really? So if I do something, it's listed on my ORCID page? As far as I know, it does. Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah, and a lot of faculty already have ORCID IDs. Um, and so it's something, even though it's, it's, it's very granular, you know, it's, I, I copy it or I reviewed one chapter, but, you know, stack a bunch of those up and that might be worth something to a tenure promotion committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we, we're uh, just, by the way, it's, it's a thing we, we expect to, I think, requires probably a hard, a hard word, but we will strongly recommend that anyone contributing to a Rebus project or contributing to projects that Rebus is on get their ORCID ID and, and, and we'll look at how we can connect those systems formally later. Um, Maybe some open discussion about this. Any thoughts on, on, on the importance of that recognition piece? Anyone who haven't we heard from? Laura, Aaron, Anne in Toronto. Anyone want to jump in with some thoughts? So this is Aaron at Utah State. So actually just today we had a, we had a meeting with one of our professors who's going to be creating an OER for us. Um, and, and his idea was, we were talking about possible peer review, external reviewers for him, and he actually, he has somebody in his, in his department here at USU who happens to be a subject expert on the very topic he's writing on, and she teaches this, this course. And so I guess my question that I keep going back to is, you know, if we, what's the difference? Like, is there a different layer of review? You know, is it, is it almost considered, you know, biased if it's somebody internal, if it's somebody within his own department versus going out, you know, and, and doing something like we're talking about with this review board, you know, would there be less of a, do you kind of know what I mean? Like, would there be less of a, is it a true peer review process if they're going with a grad student or going with somebody with, that they know? I, I'd like to comment on Aaron's question. And that is that I think it gets to why I love number three on the agenda so much and this idea of assigning a sort of label license badge whatever with all of these different types i would prefer that they're not hierarchical so it wouldn't be like gold star silver star bronze star but just like um tailored to whatever resources the institution or the author has available but to surface like well this is the process that it went through so in aaron's case i don't know if we would have a badge that said uh, you know, friend of author, look this over. Probably not, but you know, at least a, a rubric could be standardized, provided to that person. It, it could, you know, be in house. Oh, or mother said it was <laughs> right. <laughs> but you, you, you guys know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there is that, that opportunity to have the additional layer in the OTL if it ended up there, and then, you know, the uh, yet additional layer of hypothesis, perhaps, and and right. saying like, here were the goals for the first edition after peer review, the second edition. Um, so it was, it was interesting. Oh, I'll let whoever just said, um, jump in there. I was just going to say, in, in response to the question about, um, uh, Aaron's question about, you know, having somebody review from your department, it is coming from the university press world. I know that um, there are pretty um, standard kinds of rules around who you go to um, to review and who's who's eligible to review and and it's the sort of thing we have to really think through how detailed we want to get in kind of coming up with with principles best practices that sort of thing um, and the AAUP the Association of University Presses released you know has recently released a a guide to to peer review now that is for monographs but um there's good stuff in there that um we could certainly learn from and um and just in specific response to that question about getting somebody inside the department that would be that would be something as an editor reviewing a book i would say definitely not um we wouldn't allow that we wouldn't allow somebody to like the person's dissertation advisor somebody from their department um, there are there are very clear rules around uh, around that and um, and even we had things like if you are getting two reviewers for a book manuscript and should you get and you get two people um, perhaps from another school but two people from the same school we would say no we wouldn't we wouldn't allow that um, now that's that's 
probably not everybody would agree to that, but um, so there are there are kinds of ways to think through this, and it's it's all I think a lot of it is done by it it sort of developed by publishing folklore over the years and but it's never been really codified in any way and and so we can really serve some i think useful we can be very useful here in kind of thinking through some of these things and being bringing some fresh thinking to it yeah i i just wanted to jump in and and i can't remember who i'm who's thought i'm jumping off of but um the part where uh, you know, the credential of the reviewer is uh, matters or doesn't. It's, it's really interesting. Um, when I was talking to the guys at Siuvala again, who do, it's a totally different universe than I think most of us are working in, but uh, producing um, textbooks for elementary schools in South Africa, open textbooks. And they found that their open reviewing process was so powerful because you didn't have the, uh, they, they had kind of an anonymous reviewing process, but it was totally open and, and, but they actually knew who the people were because I guess they could see this from the, the back end of the system. And, and you would have sort of people who generally wouldn't get anywhere near having the authority to say, hey, this section doesn't work, who were able to do that. And I think that's a powerful thing about the notion of students feedback, et cetera, that, that uh, you know, just because you don't have the PhD in the, from the right school or the law degree from the right school, you, that students or general public or whatever in some part of this process may be able to pick out parts that are unclear, that are badly done from a, from a student point of view in a way that somebody who's very familiar with the content isn't. So, so again, I think this idea of having this be actually a, um, an advantage that open textbooks might have. I mean, I know that in the commercial publishing, there is sort of student feedback data phases sometimes, but, but if we can do this in an open way, there may be some real power to that. That's a, a hypothesis theory rather than any great statement of fact, but I think there's something very interesting there, which kind of leads into um, some of the stuff that uh, I think Nicholas wrote, and maybe Nicholas, you can take that over, just talk about kind of the, the universe, I suspect you're talking, roughly speaking, the universe of open source software and kind of the different ways that it works there. And I think there's something we learned in this universe from, from, from that. So over to you, Nicholas, for a couple of minutes on that. Yeah, um, so, so I guess something that I really see that's struggling with open textbooks is just like this one community of practice that goes behind something that makes it easy for people to come on board to discover. Um, so like when I want to discover a book, what site do I have to go to? How do I interact with the community at large? Um, I'm just going to use Reddit as an example. If anyone's familiar with Reddit or, you know, YouTube or these large community sites, there's one portal of access and you can um, really get into this rich atmosphere and this rich environment of all these interactions. And um, there's a lot of tools to interact with those communities. So when thinking about the, the open textbooks, trying to understand all the different pathways that people can interact with it and trying to understand how to maybe um, network them in such a way where when you interact with one, it's a lot easier to discover all the others. Um, so if you're really interested in, um, as a teacher and you don't have the time to review, but you want to use a book, um, having access to the, the array of books and the people that are reviewing them just builds that sense of community and use. Um, so it kind of gets a little bit into the, um, you know, like the review types, having that visualized and just being able to look at um, the information in the networks and, and make sense of it. So that's kind of what I was uh, writing about and what I'm thinking about um, is growing these, you know, these, these larger communities uh, through the tools that they use and, and how people communicate with each other. Awesome. I wonder, um, does anyone else have comments? Uh... Just looking here, Laura, did you want to say anything? Um, comments about, yeah, just this kind of notion of, I, I like this idea that, 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 that in fact, when I look at, when we've been talking about peer review, it feels like it's actually maybe the most important part of this, not specifically where, for what peer review does, but that it's, it's, it's kind of can be this central cog in community building around content. Um, 
Anyway, I'd like to hear from Laura. What, what do you have well, to say? I have to agree that, you know, um, I'm looking at peer review in particular because we have a number of faculty that uh, don't really trust um, things like, um, oh, um, I'm on um, the study abroad committee. So teaching study abroad classes or doing service learning or doing open access materials, that there's that lack of trust. And so having some kind of peer tools that are recognizable and especially if they can connect with the other ways people are describing their um, accomplishments uh, and their scholarly publications, I think that would be the best way we could go. Awesome. What about, I'm going to pick on a few people here. Um, Anne, do you have any comments? Sure. Um, I mean, I used to work in publishing, so in educational publishing, so I was familiar with the reviewing model there. And they really just looked for people that had prestige to add, um, and then they wouldn't have the same institution because the more reviewers you had or people that looked at it from a variety of sources, the more likely you'd have adoption elsewhere. So that was really important to them to scatter around. Um, and it really was by prestige, and they did pay quite well. Um, so, uh, and they would do focus groups and invite them for things and fly them places. So that, uh, yeah, so that added to the value. So I think that we have to find some kind of other value that, um, makes it, um, important. So, so reviewing then, if I'm, if I'm hearing correctly, reviewing was kind of part of the sort of publishing marketing fund probably is where it comes from and you get a nice dinner and 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 whatnot out of the process sometimes in commercial publishing yeah, part, you become part of a community they usually had it so that the viewers viewed it but you could actually get together and talk about things or you know so it was there was a couple of levels there um yeah cool. so it, it just it, there was some kind of value added to them Excellent. that was either a trip or um, they're meeting with people somewhere, they definitely would get a trip out of it. Right. I think so, the, so the question is, how does the open textbook community make sure we can offer nice trips to nice places for all reviewers of open textbooks, right? I think and the cost people, is, think. yeah. I think the cost is a particular problem for me because you know we've spent our budget on trying to get people to participate in this activity of writing and and putting these things together and I'm it uh, and so I I'm not in scholarly communication I've never done publishing so trying to find reviewers on top of it is a little bit um, of an issue for me yeah yeah so I think I mean that's going to be the experience of every, you know. 90% of the people who are in your role in the institutions around this this universe and and so that's what this call is about is how do how do we figure out how to solve this problem for you as a community together um, I think that what happened at UBC what they did um, last month is extremely important to this because it basically said that contributions to OER uh, there's now a policy at UBC yeah. And it's contributions to OER can be part of a tenure process. So if you actually are reviewing, just like you, just like editing in a journal and doing peer review in a journal, that can help um, towards your tenure. Um, if that actually people could start to get policies at their institutions where teaching was where, and there are some institutions where te there is a teaching stream. So if in those teaching streams, those kinds of policies could be encouraged, then they would the reviewing it, money isn't isn't an issue then then it becomes part of their you know their a value added thing that is really really important to them just more actually more important than the flight and the dinners yeah um the, the one thing i'd add is is in again going back to the university press world where we offer would offer honoraria and we were very clear these were token honoraria um, they weren't payment um, they were they weren't salary or whatever it was something that was it was simply a symbolic thing that that tied the author or the reviewer you know it gave them a commitment it was a way to assure that they would 
that you, there was an exchange there. So they're giving you their expertise where there was no way we were going to pay them for the really for the time they put into it. But it was it was a symbolic gesture that meant that then they were more likely to come through with a review. So you don't necessarily have to pay a lot, but payment is a way to to create that sort of gift exchange, you know, the kind of thing that anthropologists talk about. Yeah. Or or how do we how do we if if it's not money, how do we build that in again to like what are the other value exchanges that, that we can be explicitly trying to to tap into. Exactly. I think we can, we, it doesn't have to be money, but there, I think there is something to the, the sense of tying people, whether there's something that, that gives, as has been said, gives value um, uh, to them and to us and makes it worthwhile on both ends. Um. I, I've actually used I've actually used the very blatant statement that the person is helping to shape education. Yes. And change. Yeah. And, and, I mean, and so for people who are on board with the OER idea, to be a first adopter, to be a pioneer in this field, it's exciting. So I I say that straight faced and sincerely that that's really what we're doing. We are changing the face of education and publishing. Yeah. Get on board. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lisa, did you have any comments listening to all this? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm just uh, kind of like, yeah, have kind of the same experiences and um, our, um, our library has now started the program to like connect it with the faculty for our open access and OER program. So yeah, I'm, I would like to like learn more on this period and this um, project so that um, later we, when we start next semester, we can have more preparations for the program. Yeah, I guess it's it's important for all of us to remember that even Allison and Anthony and the people who've been at this for a long time, like th th everything's pretty new right now. So, you know, we have the chance here to try to shape how this goes. And I think what Deb said is really important that, the, you know, what we're all trying to do is reshape the universe of publishing and academics. And, and that's that is going to be a powerful driver, not for everyone, but for a lot of people. And we have to figure out how to articulate that well. So I think that's kind of a nice inspiring way to finish things off. Um, Zoe here has been typing. I've never, Curiously. yeah, she's, her fingers are going to be, she's going to have to soak them in an ice bath after, uh, after this. So this has been uh, pretty dense. We are going to undertake to try to, so we'll send out all the raw materials to everyone. We're going to try to shake this out into some thoughts of how we might structure going forward. I'm just wondering with this group here, are you guys willing to continue talking? Let's say we want to have a generic document that says, here's what different types of review are or the badges or if we figure out specific things that we might do, are, are you guys interested in, in continuing that conversation, maybe getting involved? I see lots of head nodding, that's good. Um, one of which is, is trying to elaborate this idea of a review board where, where you know, if we could get a you know, hundred institutions or basically every member of OTN to kind of commit to say we'll be, you know, we'll spread the word in the right department or something. I don't know exactly how that works, but um, okay, so I see lots of nodding heads. Uh, so I'm going to try to shut up. Does anyone have any last comments before we, we're two minutes after over time here? All right. I th that was, that was really fun. Yeah. I really appreciate all the input. Well, nodding, I'm going to say yes, there's another meeting planned. Uh, but we don't know when that's going to be. Um, and so we'll we'll sort of try to shake all this out and figure out maybe how we could break this into pieces that, that maybe we can focus on smaller pieces and say, what could we do in this area? 
and, and then we'll figure out next meetings and, and figure out what you guys are all getting yourselves roped into. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key. Okay. I will just mention um, there are a couple of things happening in the chat which I didn't manage to verbalize, but I have put them in the notes. Um, in particular, Brady shared a link to something about that UBC tenure process. So if you guys haven't been reading about it yet, it's in the notes and a couple of other exchanges. So this will go up in the next couple of days. Uh, so you can look over them if you're interested. Yeah, and I, I feel like that is kind of outside of peer review, but that feels like a kind of thing that the OER community could coalesce around lobbying for, which is yeah. starting to get OER contributions as uh, uh, contributing to whatever that acronym is that I forget, and RPT, yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone.